family and friends? Well, guess what? It's that time of the week again. It's time for a weekly dose of encouragement. I don't know about you, but I'm always looking to be encouraged. You know, David strengthened himself in the Lord, and so sometimes when I preach these messages, oftentimes, they're primarily directed toward me, but I am willing to bless y'all with the things that I learned from God. I hope this blesses you greatly. So if you'll open up your Bibles with me today, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17 is the 11th book in the Old Testament. Your Bible is going to begin with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. You're going to skip over four more books. You'll find yourself then at 1st and 2nd Samuel. And then guess what? The next book is 1 Kings. We're going to begin with verse 1 of 1 Kings, and we'll get into that in just a minute. The stories that we're about to uncover today, they're some of my favorite ones in the Bible because you see, God indeed is precisely predictable. In Malachi 3, 6, God says this. He says, for I am the Lord and do not change, but will remain faithful to my covenant with you. In Hebrews 13, 8, it says that Jesus Christ is eternally changeless, always the same yesterday, today, and forever. In James 1, 17, it says that God, in God, there is no variation, for he is perfect and he does not change. So as I said, God is precisely predictable. And yet, paradoxically, God's ways are wildly weird. They are curiously and confoundingly complex. His ways are often unorthodox, uncanny, unusual, and unexpected. His ways may seem at times atypical, extraordinary, and eccentric. Simply put, if you don't know the heart of the Father, his mysterious, me mysterious methods can leave you and can be make you become perplexingly puzzled. The title of this message today is Unconventional Pro Provision. Now, before I read the passage of scripture, I'd like to first define what unconventional and provision is. So, unconventional can be defined as not conventional. It can be defined as not bound by or conforming to convention, rule, or precedent, free from conventionality. Some synonyms include atypical, bizarre, eccentric, offbeat, unique, unorthodox, and unusual. Provision can be defined as an arrangement or preparation made beforehand, as for the doing of something, the meeting of needs, the supplying of needs, means. Some synonyms include allocation, arrangements, and plans. Therefore, when you put these two words together, unconventional provision could be defined as a pre-arranged meeting of needs in an atypical or bizarre manner. So let's get into the word. 1 Kings chapter 7 begins with Elijah the prophet delivering a strong pronouncement of judgment to King Ahab. Now, all throughout time, not just in Bible times, but even to this current day, a prophet is someone whom God works through to communicate his message to the word, world. A prophet is not, was not, and will never be accountable, um, or he will only be accountable for delivering what God says. He's not accountable, however, for a person's response or lack of a response. So Elijah told King Ahab, he says this in verse 1, he says, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God that I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then verse 2 says this, it says, Then the Lord said to Elijah, he says, Go to the east and hide yourself by Kareth Brook. Now, it's very important that I pause here in this story to explain a, free, a few things. First of all, every single person, every single creature that is alive must have water to survive. In fact, most human bodies have an average water content of 60%. The human body needs so much water to function that as a general rule of thumb, a human can only survive about three days without water. So did you happen to notice that promptly following the judgment of no rain, God provided an unconventional water supply for Elijah? It's kind of almost as if God is saying to Elijah, hey, listen, Elijah, listen, don't get nervous about this drought. You know, 
I am God and I know that you may need water, but I have a purposely prepared provision for you, but it's not where you're currently at. In order for you to obtain what I have for you, I need you to leave from here and go there. You see, there's going to be times in your life when everything around you begins to dry up. Maybe the favor that you've had with your boss seems to have vanished, or possibly the activities that bring you great joy no longer do. What, what you used to find great joy in has left you feeling restless within yourself and you just don't know why. What was once a vibrant oasis has evolved into an arid wasteland. It's important during those times that you have a dialogue, that you begin to conversate with the Lord, with the Father about what you're experiencing. Because I'd like to propose to you the possibility that God can use times of leanness as a strategy to get your attention. Although God may not have caused your life to become barren, he most certainly can and he most certainly will work through whatever means necessary, even a drought. If you position your heart to receive from him, you might hear him say something like this. He might just say, hey, hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Listen, do you mind if we shoot the breeze for a minute? Because guess what? I've got some secrets I want to share with you. Do you. Are you ready? Are you ready to come out of that dust bowl that you've been living in? Awesome! Well, then listen closely. I have a new assignment for you. But whatever you do, don't become offended with me. Don't get so focused on what you don't have or you'll miss what I have for you. Instead, why don't you inquire of me? Why don't you ask me what I'm doing so that we can partner together? Listen, my child, let me be perfectly clear. I have provision for you, but it's not where you're currently at. I need you to leave from here. That may mean that I need you to get out of that toxic job. I need you to get out of that destructive relationship. I need you to get away from those malignant thought patterns. I need you to deny yourself, deny your flesh, and come follow me. I need you to decide that you're worthy to be loved. You see, you must leave from here, dear one, and you must go where I am sending you so that you can obtain all the excellent things, all the promises, the blessings, the benefits, and the bonuses that I have prepared for you. Now, secondly, back to our story, did you notice that God didn't just tell Elijah to go, but he told him to go and hide. There's many times throughout the Bible where God himself hid somebody or he asked them to hide themselves. And oftentimes, the locations in which people are hidden appear less than desirable, less than enticing, less than appealing. You see, when God hides you, especially in an unconventional manner, it is for his purpose. But it is for your benefit, for your protection, your provision, your success, and ultimately, he does it for your victory. Let's look at a few examples in the Bible. First, we have Noah. In, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, God shut the door of the ark, thereby placing Noah and his family in hiding. In order to preserve Noah's life, in order to preserve his family's life, God hid Noah in a massive three-story boat with just one door and one window. When God shuts you in, when he hides you inside a place that's dark, smelly, loud, and void of nourishing light, in that place that is screaming, unconventional, unconventional, this place is unconventional. Listen, he does it to preserve you, to protect you, and ultimately to promote you. Next, we have Moses. In the book of Exodus chapters 1 and 2, there's a new Egyptian pharaoh that had just come to the throne. This pharaoh felt so threatened by the Israelites, and so he began to oppress them with hard and bitter labor. But see, the thing is, is the more that he oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied. Perplexed and intimidated by the Israelites, the pharaoh commanded and demanded, demanded all the midwives to kill every baby boy that was born. When Moses was born, 
His mother saw that he was a special baby, and so she kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she placed him in a basket and laid that basket in the Nile River. God hid Moses, a vulnerable, defenseless baby, first in the watchful care of his mother, and secondly, in a basket in the Nile River. Listen to this. The, ba- the Nile River, the Nile was filled with crocodiles. Um, can you say unconventional? And yet, tucked away in a basket in the Nile River, bursting with bloodthirsty beasts, was exactly and precisely where God hid him because God knew that that was the safest place for Moses to be. When God hides you in a place where the enemy is abundant, you must trust his process and you must trust his promises because even when pain and death are threatening to steal your peace, your joy, and possibly your very own life, If you are hidden by God, even the menacing jaws of death cannot touch you. Lastly, we've got Jonah. When Jonah tossed himself into the sea, you know, God could have allowed him to drown or to be eaten eaten alive. But instead, God hid Jonah in the foul, putrid, rank belly of a whale for his protection and for his preservation of life. And in order also to provide him safe passage. If God hides you in a place that is vile, slimy, and just plain nasty, listen, you need to know this. Being in his will is better and more beneficial than being out on your own. If necessary, God will use a whale to swallow you up in order to get you to submit to his promise process and to get you to where you need to be. Now, in Elijah's case, God told him to hide himself by Kareth Brook. The name Kareth means a cutting or a separation. At the place of a cutting and separation, God told Elijah this in verse 4. He says, drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. And it says, so Elijah did. So Elijah did as the Lord told him. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Bible history, this may not sound something that is unconventional, but it truly is really a bit nuts. Let me explain. In Leviticus chapter 11, God gave instructions to the Israelites on things they were to avoid because they were considered unclean. Beginning in verse uh, 13, God said this. He said, you shall detest among the birds. They are not to be eaten shall detest these among the birds. They are not to be eaten, for they are hated things. And then God provided a long list of birds that were unclean. Here's part of the list. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, every kind of falcon, and catch this, every kind of raven. Now, can you see the unconventionality of God's provision? First of all, God told Elijah that he would provide him sustenance via a bird, which in itself is really seriously strange. I mean, think about it. Have you ever had a bird uh, deliver you a hamburger and french fries? I haven't. Secondly, as I just pointed out, ravens were one of the birds. It was a type of bird that God explicitly commanded them to avoid. And yet, God delivered food to Elijah through the means of a detestable, hated, unclean raven. Although this clearly defines unconventional provision, this is the method that God used to sustain Elijah. When God supplies you sustenance that will nourish you and grow you, regardless of how nonsensical, peculiar, absurd, or preposterously packaged it may be, you must gobble it down like your life depends on it. Because just like Elijah, just like with Elijah, it's possible that this is the only nutrition that you will receive. I think it's safe to say that even if Elijah wasn't entirely enthusiastic about God's unconventional plans for provision, listen, he was at least willing to receive it. It's important to note this because God is about to invite Elijah once again into yet another opportunity to receive unconventional provision. Elijah, in obedience to the Lord, he hid himself by the brook and God sustained him at least for a time. 
He sustained them with water from the brook and the food from the ravens. But listen to what verse 7 says. It says, But after a while the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall in the land. When you find yourself, like Elijah, between a dried up brook and the word of the Lord, you may be tempted to be angry and offended with God, but it is imperative that you do not lose focus. Listen, if God provided for you once before, you most certainly can believe and trust that he will provide for you again. Sometimes the brook that God has used to sustain and nourish you will dry up because God's moving you to a new location. God has something new for you. He has something better for you. And the only way to get your attention is for the abundance that you've experienced to shrivel up, causing you to become thirsty once again for a new word from him, thereby forcing you to seek that word and seek his face. And you can trust that God will show you just like he was going to show show Elijah what to do next. Verse 8 says this. It says, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath. I have instructed a widow to feed you. From the get-go, this assignment again screams unconventional. First of all, God is sending Elijah to a widow A widow is a woman who at one point had been married, but she's no longer married because her husband has died. And some of the words that are described to use, uh, to some words that describe Old Testament widows include desolation, poverty, indebtedness. They often had great need and they represented the poorest of the poor. Now, why in the Tom Tardy would God send Elijah to a wanting widow? On the surface, this just makes absolutely no sense. And secondly, God sent Elijah to the village of Zarephath. Zarephath means smelting place. Now, if you're like me, I had no idea what smelting is, so let me define it. Smelting is an energy-intensive process which requires high temperatures to refine ores into usable metal. In simple English, smelting is similar to the process of refining, purifying, or cleansing metal in order to make it stronger. So God sent Elijah to a widow, to the poorest of the poor, in order to strengthen his inner man through more refining. Now, it seems like to me that it's possible, like, I don't know, but I think that Elijah has been through quite a bit of refining already, right? Don't you think? Although God, what God tasked Elijah with seemed irrational, listen to what verse 10 says of Elijah's outrageous obedience. It just says, so Elijah went. When God gives you a task that sounds strange, you must, like Elijah, in outrageous obedience, say yes and then do what God has tasked you to do. Continuing on, it says, As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little bit of water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, and he said, Bring me a bite of bread, too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I only have a handful of flour in the the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of a jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I would die. Can you feel the despondency in this widow's response? It's as though a megaphone of hopelessness has been applied to her wretched situation, intensifying and amplifying its cry to all who come near. Helpless! Helpless! You are not enough! You'll never be enough! And although Elijah discerned that this widow was undoubtedly in a dire and desperate dilemma, he denied despair and delivered a seemingly ridiculous but hope-filled word of promise to the widow. Disregarding hopelessness, he told the widow this in verse 13. He says, do not be afraid. Do you hear these words that God is speaking to you? He's telling you, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just as you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left over to prepare a meal for yourself and for your son. Now remember, 
Elijah, as a prophet to the Lord, represented God. He said and he did what God was saying and doing. If the widow gave to Elijah, it would be like giving to God. Although God's, or although Elijah's next words contain a promise from the Lord, the promise came with the condition. You see, it required the widow to take action and to respond to the promise. Elijah told her this. She, he said this. He said, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be. Listen, Elijah, through God, through Elijah, didn't say, listen, sometimes there's going to be, or maybe every once in a while there'll be, or maybe when you've had a good day, there will be, or there might be, or hmm, let me ponder. No, it says there will always be. There'll always be enough flour. There'll always be enough olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. You see, if the widow chose to take her focus off of her lack and put all of her efforts and all of her energies into obedience and through faith and give to God, she would always, always, always not just have some, not just have a little, she would always have more than enough. So what did she do? Good question. Listen to what verse 15 says. It says, so she did, as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. You see, God tested the widow's faith, and she passed the test. And God then rewarded her faith and kept his promise. Oftentimes, God is asking you to do something, and in the natural It'll make zero, zero sense. It won't line up. You see, when God asks you to do something that appears to be completely unconventional, but has his handwriting all over it, when the only way that your faith can be spelled is R-I-S-K, listen, your yes to the Lord is the Father's invitation to trust him, and it opens the door for the Lord to do what he did with the widow. Show himself Faithful, keep his promises and provide more than enough. When lack is harassing you and taunting you and staring you down, trying to uh, implore you to give up and give in, listen, when it's screaming at you and you feel like that voice is so loud, do you know what the father says to you? He says this, he says, you will always have enough through me. When you find yourself being asked by God, just as he did the widow, what do you have to offer me? Listen, if your only response is this feeble little cry, just this little bit of flour, just this little bit of oil, I know it ain't much, but it's all I've got. Did you know that when you say that, that God looks upon your offering, your gifts, your talents, your worship, whatever it might be, and he says, woohoo, all right, that is so awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so thankful for what you've offered me. And then he tells you, he says, this is so wonderful. I can take that and I can multiply it exponentially. Today, I want you to remember three unshakable truths. First of all, God always keeps his promises. Second, when out of obedience, you do things God's way, you can expect an exponential increase. Third, God's promises always provide more than enough. Now, as I always do, I, I, I'm going to get a little bit personal with you. In my own personal life, my brook would dry up time and again, and we'd be forced to move on to the next place. Unfortunately, on many occasions, especially when I was beginning my walk, early in my walk with the Lord, I, I would go in obedience, but I would leave here and go there almost begrudgingly. Throughout the years, I have repeatedly seen God be faithful. I've come to a place of loving the times where God works through marvelously mysterious methods. One thing I've come to know is this truth. As the level of unconventionality increases, so must your level of faith rise as well. 
And as the greater the level you learn to trust God's heart, the greater the favor, the greater the revelation, the greater the intimacy, the greater the joy that you get to receive from God. What a remarkably beautiful thing it is to not just know, not just hear these words and have someone speak this over you, but when you know deep down inside of you that when you can't see the Father's hand, you truly can trust his heart. So one of those times for me was in 2014. Kelly was still serving in the military. We were stationed out at Dias Air Force Base in Abilene, Texas. And we were in a really good place. Life was really, really good. I was leading a ministry. We were being stretched. We were growing leaps and bounds. Huh. But in full disclosure, the truth is that we really weren't doing as good as we thought we were. Or maybe a better way to say it is this. You see, complacency had pulled the wool over our eyes, causing us to believe that we were in this amazing place, perched atop a mountain, the height of our career, the best part of our lives, when in all actuality, we were just barely treading water, preparing, waiting for that next wave to hit us. You see, there was one area of my life in which I was just at an absolute standstill. I was completely and entirely debilitated by my inability to dream. My husband, over the years, would often ask me, he would say, hey, Candace, where do you want to do? Where do you want to be in five years? And my response over the years would be just incredibly irrational. Instead of pondering his question, instead of wondering with excitement and delight, I would become completely disengaged. I would shut down entirely. You see, his desire to dream would cause anger to well up inside of me. Now, oh, bless his heart, when Kelly would want to dream about our future together, I'd get angry, I'd get defensive, and I'd respond, um, listen, I'm having a hard time getting through today. How in the world can I play in five years out? Remember I told you at the beginning of this little testimony that um, I thought I was in a good place? Man, was I deceived. So I know that this sounds probably extreme to some people. I mean, seriously, when someone asks you to dream, your response is anger. I know that that sounds extreme. And even looking back, it sounds really crazy to me. But when I look back, all I can say is, wow, God, you're so faithful to me. Look how far we've come together. Let me explain something to you. See, the reason why I would panic when Kelly would want to dream with me is that because of much of my life, up until that point in my life, had been filtered through the lens of trauma and disappointment. One of my favorite ways that I've heard trauma defined is this. Trauma is any place in your life where your capacity for pain exceeds your capacity for joy. So, let me just put it to you this way. Some people think, well, I haven't had a big trauma. I haven't been run over by a car. I haven't, whatever. But it's just really any place where you've had capac your capacity for pain way went higher than your capacity for joy. Let's say you were expecting something particular for your birthday and everything led up to it, making you think that that was gonna happen and on your birthday, it didn't happen. Well, you were hurt and your capacity for pain exceeded your capacity for joy. That's what trauma can be. Now, I'm not looking for trauma at every corner. I'm just saying that's one of the easier ways to look at what trauma is. So, as for me, I've been sexually abused when I was a child. My parents divorced when I was around four or five. While in my early teen years, in the span of about three years, three of my very close friends died. They didn't just die, they had very tragic deaths. In my early 20s, I was pregnant for the first time with my daughter, McKenna, and she died when I was 37 weeks pregnant. After that, Kelly and I lost several more babies. In 2003, we adopted our son, Brendan, which was an amazing, huge blessing. But Brendan was very sick. He was a very sick baby and very sick child due to things that um, happened in utero. He had autism, ADHD, sensory integration disorder, and fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, as a side note, the, the Lord did heal him in 2013. Then when our youngest son, Corbin, was born in 2004, he almost died when he was just seven hours old. During the first few years of Corbin's life, he almost died three more times. 
from my late teens until I was about 34 years old. I suffered from um, severe anxiety, panic disorder, depression, and from suicidal thoughts. And again, the, the Lord healed me in 2010. Woohoo! That in itself is a good one. The point is this. Trauma does some really weird things to people. It causes them to, to remain stuck back where the trauma initially occurred. And if you don't receive healing, especially in places of trauma, you can get stuck emotionally in the moment that caused you pain. Not only that, but then the filter then that you process life through is through the filter of trauma. Let me give you an example. You can think about it this way. So if a person perceives life primarily through their eyes, then let's say that if I interlace my fingers together, and this could represent trauma. This represents a trauma that you experience. When trauma goes unresolved, it's like having your fingers interlaced over your eyes. You might still be able to see, but your vision is going to be blurry and skewed. So although I had, been, I had received lots of healing in my life, one area that I had just I just refused, I guess, to allow God to come and heal was in the area about dreaming about my future. That means that although I was 40 years old at the time whenever this is happening in 2014, there were places inside of me that were stuck back in the past, refusing to budge, incapacitated and frozen, unable to move forward and move past the place where trauma initially occurred. You see, the filter of trauma and disappointment, it distorts your view. It prohibits you from envisioning a future filled with potential, promise, possibility, and prosperity. I'm going to say this one more time. When you don't grieve and heal from traumatic events, you get stuck at the age that the trauma occurred. And not only can you get stuck, but a part of your heart can fall asleep. Your heart can fall asleep or it can die, which prevents you from living a life here in the present and having hope for the future. So for probably a decade or more, I had been standing at a crossroads trying to have courage to take the path of faith instead of despair. You see, I was kind of like that widow. I literally had almost nothing to offer God in the way of my hopes and my dreams. I truly believe it is impossible to move to the new place with God if you are paralyzed with hopelessness. But God, he saw me, he saw my heart, and he knew that it was time to challenge the lies that I was believing and to replace them with his truths. So back to my story. For several years, I had been intentionally working on allowing the Father to breathe life into the places that I had been experiencing, or that I had experienced trauma, so that I could heal my heart. And in the spring of 2014, Kelly was uh, finishing out his military career. We were only going to have a couple more years left in the military. And he was dreaming once again about our future. And he invited me to join him. One day, he said to me, Candace, what do you want to do? Where do you want to be in five years? And on that day, I didn't get angry. I didn't disengage, but rather I engaged in the conversation. And shockingly, I began daydreaming with him about our future. Now, looking back on it, I don't remember having this holy moment. I don't remember the clouds parting and the angels coming down and singing the hallelujahs or, you know, the Lord descending. I don't remember anything like that happening. I don't remember anything spectacular, but what I do remember is I remember making it a practice to ask God to sanctify my imagination and to reignite my hoper so that I might dream with him again. This was something new for me, and it was a slow process at first. In those moments, I honestly wasn't even aware that I was allowing myself to dream of my future with Kelly. I didn't realize then also that by engaging and daydreaming and dreaming of my future with Kelly, it was an active work, it was an act of worshipful obedience to the Father. And as I began to daydream, I unknowingly offered God my handful of flour and my little bit of cooking oil at the bottom of the jug. 
as I began to dream with God and with Kelly, my capacity to trust the Father began expel expanding, and I developed an ability to envision my future, to speak out my dreams with anticipation instead of fear that they might be stolen. You see, God took my little meager handful of flour, my little bit of oil that I had, and he said, oh, wow, Candace, well done, look at you. He told me, he said, I'm so proud of you. With great joy, I received that flour, I received that oil, and then guess what? He told me this, he said, you passed the test. Not only did you pass the test, but you passed it with flying colors. Way to go in trusting me. Then he told me this. He said, Candace, since you've been faithful with this, how about we dream some more together? What do you want to do? Now, before I knew it, I was in full-on dreaming mode. I began to dream big, huge, gargantuan, God-sized dreams. And then God started doing some really awesome stuff. He would come and visit me during my night watches, and he would talk to me in my dreams about my future. He would give me dreams about things that I could never even think of or imagine, because in my natural man, I am not that amazing. But in God, I am. My life was radically changed from that point forward. I, remad I imagine it was the same with the widow. As she dedicated the little that she had to the Lord, she went from pitiful to providential. She went from lack to abundance, from victim to victorious. She was once known as a woman with, with one foot in the grave, but now she is known as the woman with favor and fortune in God. She was once known as a despondent, depressed, and downright disaster of a woman, but now she is known as a triumphant, confident conqueror. From that point on, she would be known as the woman that God had restored and redeemed. I believe that the reason why God really wanted me to release this message, especially right now, in light of everything that is going on in the world, is that God wants to do the same with you. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore the places where trauma and lack have become your filter. He wants to breathe life into places where you've given up and given in. He wants to awaken the places that your heart has grown cold. God wants to remove the stony hardness of your heart where you've determined, I am never going to dream again. I am never going to hope again. He wants to come and make us home, put his hope, put his light in those places. God wants to breathe life into your dreams. But he's asking you, what do you have? What do you have to offer me? It doesn't matter how little it is. It doesn't matter how bad you've been hurt. Would you just offer it to me? Would you trust me to take that little bit that you have and turn it into something amazing? I can turn it into abundance, he says. I want to do that for you is what the father is saying. He wants to know, would you let him do that for you? You see, the Father, his great desire is to reveal himself as Jehovah Jireh, which means the one who provides. Do you know God as the one who provides? Would you like to know him as the one who provides? You see, in Genesis 22, when the Lord asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, his promise as an offering to God, you see, God, it would appear like the very last minute, would appear like almost too late. God provided Abraham a lamb so that Abraham would not have to sacrifice his son, his dream, his promise from God. It is there that God promised that he would provide. And guess what? He undubitably, unquestionably, certifiably provided. And it's there that God's name, Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides, is first established. Jehovah Jireh, in its very literal meaning, means this. It means the Lord who will see to it. Can you just say that? Can you say the Lord who will see to it? 
Y'all, there's just power when you say that. The Lord who will see to it. Because we don't understand Jehovah Jireh. Like, we speak English, right? But when you say the Lord who will see to it, do you have a place in your life where you need God, the Lord who will see to it, to see to it? Do you need to be walking in that place where you know him as the Lord who will see to it? You see, our Father in heaven, he is the Lord who will see to it. Signed, sealed, delivered. It's a done deal. You see, when you ask the Father for help, when he promises you something, he does it every time. It's not like a when he when he gives you a promise, when he speaks life into you, it's not a maybe. It's not like a, hmm, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. It's a done deal. God is the Lord that will see to it. The Lord who will see to it wants to heal your heart. He wants to restore your dreams and increase your capacity to trust him. So I'd ask you, would you, as an act of your faith, in full obedience, hand him your flour and your oil? Would you be willing to say to the Father, I don't have much, but I'll give you what I have. As I said, I, I really feel like part of the reason why this message is imperative and so important, especially right now, is because, you know, our lives in 2020 have been turned completely upside down. So many of us, this is not what we were hoping for. This is not what we expected. I remember at the end of 2019, there were all these prophetic words coming out. 2020, it's the year of increased vision. It's the year of seeing the more of God. It's the year of, you know, and they just kept releasing all these prophetic words. And then the coronavirus hit and lives were just being lost at an exponential rate. And people were uncertain of their future and they were uncertain of what to do and fear just invaded our country. And then there was all the riots and, and all of that and, and people are just angry. And you know, hurting people hurt people. And so I've been thinking and pondering and praying about like, what does it look like for, for the people that you know, this was their high school graduation. You, you, you've you worked and you've worked and you've worked and, you know, you got into high school and you finally passed everything and you were ready to graduate only to not even be able to throw your cap up in the air with your friends. Or what if, what if you're someone who's been wanting to get married for years and years and years, but it hasn't been the right time and God finally provides you the person of your dreams and yet you can't even celebrate your wedding because of the coronavirus, because of having to wear masks. Or I thought about the people that, you know, they're a first time mother and they're so excited. They've always dreamt of being a mother and then their dreams of, of delivering a baby have been robbed or they've been stolen from or they haven't gotten a full delivery. They haven't gotten to enjoy it with their family. Maybe they couldn't even invite their mom. I mean, I don't know, but whenever, when I delivered McKenna, that was, a total blow. It was a total letdown. I had always dreamt of being a mother. And so when my first child, my first daughter dies while I'm carrying her, not at five weeks or 10 weeks or even 20 weeks, but 37 weeks, she could have completely lived outside the womb. That rocked me. That changed me. That caused me to see the world different. You know, there's been so much trauma that has happened, especially because of the coronavirus. So many people are hurting, but God, he is faithful even when we're faithless, and he really does. If, if God would do it for me, he would do it for you. God doesn't just bring restoration and healing and hope just to the elect few. He doesn't just do it for some people and not for other people. But you have to be willing, I believe, to offer him what you have. And if all you have is a broken, hurting heart, if all you have is hopelessness and despair, hand it to him. That's It's an offering to give him the lack and ask him for the abundance. You know, it says in John 10.10, but the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, right? All this corona, all of that, that's not God. Because it says then that God came to give us life 
and life in the full to abundance to overflowing. And so if you're experiencing life, if you have experienced life and you're not overflowing with joy and you're not overflowing with peace and you're not overflowing with the goodness and the kindness of the Lord and the land of the living, then it's time to just lay down your pride, lay down your expectations and hand those things to God and ask God to do something miraculous with it. Because God truly does want to provide. But you have to understand that God loves to provide in unconventional manners. It's not going to look the same for you as it does for me. God knows that I need, um, I'm a very precise person. So he speaks to me with really specific numbers or colors or shapes or whatever it is. He speaks to me in dreams. But he's also a very vague God in that he doesn't have just one way of doing things. For instance, in the Bible, he healed people different ways, you know, healed their eyes. He didn't just spit in everyone's eye. And if he did, that would be the formula. But he's not a man who who follows a formula, except for this. God is good. He is always good. He is always faithful. You can always trust God. And if you have places in your life where you don't feel like you can trust God, then what's happened is that there was a lie that you believed about yourself, about the world, about the power of the enemy who really is powerless, or possibly, and most certainly, very likely, that you've believed a lie about the King of Glory, who again came to give life and life abundantly. So if you're not experiencing an abundant life, I'm not talking about a life that's completely free of pain and free of problems and free of sorrow and all of those things, but if you are not experiencing an abundant life, then I would like to introduce you to a man named Jesus. He came to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, to bring restoration and healing and hope for all of us. For all of mankind, he came so that not one would be lost. Jesus leaves the 99 and comes searching after you, the one. If you are the one, if you have been running from him, if you've been hightailing it the opposite direction, today's the day. I would encourage you, today is the day. He's speaking to you. He wants you to come near. I also want to tell you that that God is not up in heaven angry. He's not sitting up there angry and judging you and ready to just smite you. Romans 5.1 says that we are at peace with God and that he is at peace with us. God is at peace with you. Sometimes you just need to say that over yourself. Remind yourself, Romans 5.1. Remember what, the, what Jesus did when he was out in the desert and he was being tempted by the devil? He quoted scripture, and you can do the exact same thing. When your world is not filled with peace and you're feeling like everything is turning upside down and you don't understand why, sometimes the place to start is, God, your word says that in Romans 5.1 that you're at peace with me. So I can be at peace with myself and I can be at peace with the world. And then you just start inviting his peace and feel the atmosphere around you shift. The word of God is strong and it's powerful and it cuts and it tears down things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. One of the ways that I really started a few years back is I started dreaming with God as I, I mentioned I also just started putting a stake in the ground. God, you are good. You are for me. You do only good. And so if it doesn't look good, it's not over yet. And I have to find you. One of the things that I love to bless people with is I love to bless people with, I bless you to find God in that place. Do you know God in the place of suffering? Because he's there with you. He didn't cause the suffering but he is there with you in the suffering. Do you know God in the place of confusion when the swirl is all around? Can you find him? Because remember, Jesus was in the storm, but the storm wasn't in Jesus. Do you know God in the place of joy when you're having a great time? God loves to laugh. It says that he who sits in the heavens laughs. God loves to laugh. Do you know God when you're happy? Do you know God in the place where grief and sorrow are threatening to consume you? Let me tell you, I do. I know him there. And um, it's a really neat thing to know him in that place because he's the comforter. 
and he comes and he can just wrap you up with his love and embrace you. And so it's, it's time to dream again. It's time to hope again. It may be that after hearing this, you might just need to repent. And repent is not a bad word. I know to some people they think it is, but really it simply just means to just change the way you think, to have another thought, to go kind of the opposite direction. I am going toward hatred and all of this bad stuff. Okay, well, I repent. God, I'm sorry, and we're going to go the other direction. Repentance is a gift from God, and it's an amazing tool to realign yourself with kingdom truths and values. And so if you find yourself today hearing these stories from the Bible, which are amazing, but then hearing me share my heart, sharing the places where I was very vulnerable with you and told you, like, I was afraid to dream. You know, part of my process was I had to repent. God, I'm sorry that I have not been willing to dream. I hand I hand that over to you, and I ask that you would do something beautiful with it. But if you find yourself in that place, don't let this moment pass you by. Because let me tell you, the phone will ring, a new text message will come in, Facebook, you're on Facebook right now probably, will distract you. And the next thing you know, this place where God was coming, doing a mighty work in your heart, where you feel Holy Spirit spurning you to something good and something great and to healing. If you don't seize the moment, it will pass you by. And then you'll forget about it until the next time that Jesus comes knocking on your door like he is today, calling your name, saying, come talk with me. I want to share you with you secrets. So today is a great day to realign yourself. As I close out, let me pray for you real quick. Father, I thank you that you reveal yourself as Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. And I thank you that as your name declares, as it says, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who sees to it, that you are never late, never early, but always and forever, perpetually and purposefully on time. Father, I ask that you would just come and reveal your timeliness and your provision and your heart to those who are desperate to seek you, to see you, to know you, God. God, there's been so many people so hurt from the coronavirus and from all the destruction and chaos that has happened in our world, especially in this last year. And Father, I ask that you would come and show yourself faithful. Jehovah Jireh, Come and show yourself. Come and provide for them in, in an un, unconventional way. Ways that without, a, without knowing, God when, God, when you are revealing yourself, whenever you come and do unconventional things, the thing about it is, is that we can't point to anybody but you. When you fed, when you fed Elijah with a raven, there was no, nothing. There was nothing that he could point to except for you, God. So I ask that you come and do that now. I ask that you come and reveal yourself to those whose hearts have fallen asleep. God, people need to wake up. It's time for people to wake up. People's hearts need to start beating again. The rest of their bodies, their mind, their soul, their spirit, man, they need that blood. So God, I ask that you come and do for them what you did for me. Come and reveal yourself to those that need a word from you. God, there are people out there, I just know it because I can sense it and I can feel it right now, that without a word from you, God, right now, without a touch from you, life will cease to exist. So, Father, I ask that you come and show them how much you love them. Come and wrap them up with your arms of love and with your arms of grace. Let them be overwhelmed with your goodness. Father, if you did it for me, you would do it for them. So right now, I just continue to release the testimony that there's nothing too big for God. There is nothing too great for God. God loves you. You are his absolute favorite, and he desires to come and fill you up, fill you to overflowing. Father, I thank you that whenever you do big things for them, that your people will not be a hoarder of your revelation, but that they would share with the world around them. If everyone just shared with just one person, think about how different the world would look. So may we not be hoarders of your revelation, Father, but let us share with the world your greatness. 
Father, may it be said that we made you famous on this earth. Amen. Well, I bless you today, as I always do. I bless you to be everything you were created to be. Nothing more, nothing less, perfectly perfect in every way. I bless you with identity and favor and value and worth. I bless you to have people come alongside you, to walk this road with you, to call you up and call you out, to speak life into you. I bless you to know Jesus very deeply, very intimately, and I bless you to have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.